the thing you don't like about yourself, that's the magic. That's the part you need to play up a little more. Because that's different. That's you. It was just me, Nate, and Cap. Yeah. All the resistance on that record. And then... But when you listen to it, you wouldn't think that. It sounds a lot bigger than that, don't it? But we, you know, we was we was we was cool and thorough in our own right, you know, here in Plainfield. We 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 was well respected as a family band, you know, doing what we do. And that's all we knew, so that's all we did every day. You know, we put music together, played music. When we came home, we came home to practice, to rehearse. When we came in from on the streets, we came in to practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's what we did. To the point where we got tired of oh, it. Oh, man. We was practicing the same music for years, man. Not just for gigs, for years. What instruments did y'all play? It was me on the piano, mm -hmm. Kevin on the guitar, and you on the drums. That was the first pass. Yeah. And then you and Kevin overdubbed the guitars. Yeah. Who did? Who did? Yeah, me, yeah, me, me and Kevin. No, me, Just me, because that's when Bruce, when we first started the song, Bruce hadn't put no money behind it, right? It was just me and you and Kevin. Yeah. Well, when Bruce took over and started paying for the sessions, he just put, yeah, he, he put, he put gay, his, was it yeah. gay and Michelle? I don't know who. The, I, I think it was. Like. Somebody I think said it was Sissy Fitz, but then somebody said it wasn't Sissy. Somebody Fitz. said it was Denise. Yeah, that's who it was. That's who it was. Kevin's old girlfriend. Just by being affiliated and associated with Motown, doors just fly open. That's what happened. But through it all, I always remained independent. I did what I had to do, and I never gave up, even when people were saying, man, why don't you put that guitar down, put it down, put it down. I said, nah, you keep hitting that tight, and I'll do this. And besides, if you can't tune my guitar, shut up. You know, so. Most musicians, man, in America today, they, you know, they, they're just not making it, man. You understand what I'm saying? I will support myself. People were looking at me, oh, you crazy. Why are you spending all your money doing that? I, I had to do it. For me, I discovered America, I discovered music. And for me, the only music that was good music, is for, for musicians, there's only good and bad. For me, for that time, the, the best music was dance music. Even the rap, it was the best. It was uh, people, they were singing way of their life. For me, and I came from, I came from, to come from the bottom of the world to the top of the world in New York City, I had one of the most successful independent record labels. Tell me what's your number. This is my son. I'm telling you, I didn't know, like, you know, like I told you, like, even when, he, when they did the ILO, they could use anybody. They used a fourth grader. You know what I'm saying? And that was, like, the vibes of, of the studio. It was like, you know, you came in, I don't know, my father just had a heart, and he didn't care. This is a story from New York, not the New York of Manhattan, the skyscrapers, and Broadway, but from perhaps the toughest square mile in the city, in the South Bronx. I want to say everything influenced me. And all kinds of people influenced me in my life and my nature and my dancing and everything. In the 70s, I was everywhere. I went everywhere. I heard it all, you know? But what I saw in the Bronx was 
not happening anywhere else. Yeah, they had DJs, but they were not hip hop DJs. Mainly playing the breaks, hitting the hard beat. They play the music and they'll mix it, but they're not scratching it like the Bronx. They wasn't working their magic on it like that. Taking rock and then swishing it, mixing it into disco, taking it back into funk, funk into. Until like, like maybe I got in high school, junior high school, and they're playing this record. We go to school party and they're, you know, Funkadelic record come on, knee deep, one nation under the. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> He's famous. <laughs> so then you get into it and stuff. I mean, we always heard the stuff, but it was just like, okay, it's nothing, you know, because there was always music around. You know, so it was, you know. When we moved into this house, we used to live three or four blocks over. And my parents bought this house. And even then, we'd be sitting around, we would, young kids sitting around Gary sitting on the couch playing his guitar he used to like oatmeal he used to eat a lot a big bowl of oatmeal and be on the phone with his girlfriend playing the guitar and I don't know if you remember we used to get these big store catalog books and we used to have this store catalog book with everything in it he'd go through it and you see something like can you can you buy me that he said I'm gonna buy you that when I get famous I'm gonna buy you that it's like he knew he was gonna be famous because that's all he ever did. He never had a job. My mother had me December 10th at 53 in Moorhead, Mississippi. I was born in the house with a midwife in the dining room. And uh, <clears throat> she brought me here in March of 1954. I was three months old. And from there, I picked up the guitar at 12 years old. But before that, I played harmonica. Music was always something in me because when I would go to Chicago, spend the summers with my father in Chicago, well, he or either my grandfather would take me to the south side of Chicago where Chess Records was. And I saw all these people. Holland Wolf, Lil, Lil Milton, uh, Bobby Blue Bland, Ed James, all of them just in and out. My grandfather was good friends with all of them because they came from Mississippi. The blues. When I was uh, in high school, I got one piano lesson. I learned how to play the, the scale, the C major scale. My my aunt, she told me how to. But I thought it was corny to play the piano. I'm a trumpet player. I majored in music. You know, I graduated from Queens College. I have a BA in music. I had one lesson, man, and from that one lesson, I was able to, it took years, but guess what, that's all right, you know. I love music so much, I just love it, man. So don't fight the school. Hey, girl, I wrote the song, the words, everything, the music, I did, and I, I had the girls, um, there was a group called Lorelei, they sang it. that hey it's just the right thing to do and do it the only thing that's holding you back is you am i right or wrong i knew all the djs and i was in the clubs friday saturday i was in discotheque all night from one place to another place for now taking my record an acetone you know what i mean actually from a mother when you record it first to see the reaction that i'm getting from and i know this i know most of these djs i knew them a lot of these big labels, they, didn't, they were behind. Sugar Hill Gang, it went, if that was not, on a, even if it was R&B, the radio station, they had no choice because they were receiving so many phone calls. 
they have a face. They may, if it's more in a short version, the radio station editing themselves. But otherwise, the AM big, the AM station, Brenton, or, or Rock station, they don't want to play this. Song. I'm coming. Like when we make Kuzash, we wasn't thinking radio, we were thinking sound system. You know, like dope music, sound system. You think of what some big sound gonna do with this, how they gonna manipulate it. You just want to hear every ingredient, you know. And, and like I told you, when I go out in these big places and I hear this stuff that we did in that small space, I, I really start paying more attention. I, I go to England, same way, you know, and I walk through the door, when I step in, you know, you got to take a break, you know, and you're wondering if it's too much bass for your body, but when you look and you see people dancing, then you feel, well, I guess, you know, it's like you got to get adjusted. <laughs> so, I, I really love Europe for that, the presentation. Japan is like that. But the world is getting more like that now. We come to the music. My mom and pop always show love in front of me, always dance in front of me. As being Puerto Ricans and Blacks, I think more from the Puerto Rican side maybe, more Latino family parties, everybody's dancing, a lot of people just enjoying. They push you to dance, they push you to get in there, you know? Your aunt want to dance with you, your cousin want to dance with you, everybody's dancing, you're dancing in the street, and always in the street, always doing jams like Mario did in the schoolyard. Without that, the young kids couldn't get no knowledge of no hip hop or anything about anything. Because they, they, we were too young to go into these clubs. They had bands out there just playing live, drum and everything. That was a dope part too. You go to Katona Park, they had live Hispanics out there just playing funky shit. It could be Hispanic beats, it could be funk beats. It was just live. But just like ESG, same thing. Those are street bands, street people. Yeah, those are just cool people with Moody and all that. I knew them from uh, Morehouse. Morehouse. Most of them was from there, ESG and them. They play right there in St. Mary's Park. I think it's all about the revolution. Revolution plus hip hop makes everything hard. That's why it makes the dance hard, makes a party hard, everybody getting together for this revolution. And, you know, the hard beats go with the hardness of like, yo, fight the power shit, you know? He, yo, you gotta hear what the ghetto is talking. Nate wrote the song. I don't even know how we ended up going into the studio to cut the song. But we, we, we found this studio out in Middlesex, Tatshia Studio. His name, the guy's name was T. Demarell. He had a studio and a school, a music school. Nice studio, eight track. And we cut the rhythm tracks and the, the part of the vocals. And then we just let it go for a minute. And then Bruce came in and finished it. He came in and took us back in and finished the record, mixed it, and then he said he was gonna press it. He pressed it up. We was always down here recording. We had a little four, I had gotten a little four track. And we were sitting right there in that, where that organ is. And you know how we come down here and we start recording <laughs> and stuff on the four track, man, we thought we was the Jackson Five. Yeah, man. <laughs> this is at Madison Square Garden in New York. Brian. And, um, we went on first, we warmed the crowd up. It was nice, you know. We put our little thing on money. And then the Jackson Fire came and the place went crazy. That's when you saw the whole, the Madison Square Garden smelled like reefer. The whole, I mean, the, everybody was smoking. I mean, they were screaming and going off. Man, those guys just rocked. Yeah, and, 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 and. I met all of them. I met Joe, you know, the father. I met Michael, I met Ruffles, I met them all, you know, and, and it was great. Whenever I would record something, 
I had the sophistication of the Motown sound, the smoothness of the Philly sound, the funk of James Brown. And I put them all three together and called it the town sound. That music all had the same feeling to it. It's a type of music you could put on and you could get in your car and that music will float right with you. Because I don't have a lot of complicated bridges in it. You know, I make music for riding. You know, you could ride to my stuff. Ride on my freeway, baby. Larry Levan, he was working in the most progressive as a gay club in the village. This place like actually was a, a garage, but the place was taking like up to five thousand people. And all these people were record buyers. All these people that go in these discotheques, they were besides being this they were called them Ginzo. They, all the people goes with ties and you know what I mean? Like the guys John Travolta would like to dress up. But all the other discotheque people used to go to have fun. We going back in the seventies, late seventies, early eighties. We talking about more than a million people were out in the discotheques, nightclubs. That was in. That was the biggest thing that was there. So we talking about the people were here the most of the time. That like the, the that break, you know, in the musical break that they were the part of. That was like the best part of the record. The people goes crazy, screams, and jump. They had the records. They will remember just that line, and they were catching songs and that. What is it sold? That's what sold the records. I was, I was making, I was going to the studio in one night. I would make the records, but here, heard them 100, 200 times, or 300 times before I mixed it, cut it, edited it, and put it out. And I have the record immediately. We're talking about what the big label could not do, the small companies were able to do it. Like in New York City, we have three, four independent distributors. They were not pressing for a big label, but they were doing for the small, small labels. They were working 24-7. 24-7, they were pressing the records. And this was all cash business, all cash. You, you even have problem getting you, sometimes you were, you were selling, you can sell a week up to 50 or 100,000 copies, alone in New York City. I used to just love foot now, man. I put out a record and I make 500, you know, I'm not going to wait to sell the 500 to go cut the next stamp. As long as I had the money, I was cutting the stamp. I don't care if I say 300, 500, if I have to repress it, that's good. If I win money, even at my age, yeah, I'm still going to build. Technically, like a studio with different place, more like a community type of thing. I could still help, you know, fourth graders. <laughs> you, 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 you know what I mean? To, to see the vision. So, you know, uh, for, for me, you know, money is good to maintain, keep you going, but. You could have all that money and have no peace, like I was saying earlier. The people, it's like a whole group of us that's like this. You know what I mean? And we play different parts. You know what I mean? So, you're here to hold up one part, and I'm here to hold up the next part. And together, we're doing this. Well, for me, the, my best feeling was without even people, DJ, seeing me playing my record, the people jumping like him. 
the frenzies that you see on those faces in that part of the record because when the people hear that it was like what is this coming from it's like you were hitting from somebody it's like uh, it was like ali hitting you with, with a shuffle bam 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 you understand it was very important who was the guy who mastered the record if you want to get high quality the deeper the cut is in the in vinyl the better sound the, 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 the highs and everything you, you that you could and the big labels did not do this we knew because you i would go when the guy mastered my song when he was master cutting the master a mother you know what i mean when he making from acetone you know when he first i was right there when he, i listened to how the mother was cut from mother he cuts the as though he had to take it to a place where they making a mother so stampers it's called stampers the stamps the records okay from from plastic a warm hot plastic so you had to actually it, the most you can plus uh, press out of those stampers side a b is 1500 records if you press more than 1500 you lose on the quality of sound because you wear down the, the the cuts of the of the groove of the of the of the record it loses the quality so the small label had an advantage then over big labels <laughs> You know, I sing some couple of songs for Prince Boss. You know what I mean? And I used to hang at Jew Creek, but when I was hanging at Jew Creek, I was there with like Strange Accord. And uh, Joe White was there. Can do four techniques and all that stuff. I used to do a poetry in Jamaica, but when I come here, I went to school and um, I went into steel, like you know, steel work on these buildings. So some of the roadways I drive on the bridges today that wasn't there you know i remember tying steel on those buildings but what happened is after a while you know they have like a savings plan like annuity they call it so I, one weekend i just went to the union hall i took out all my money and all my savings and i drove I had a station wagon. I went straight to the music store and that station wagon I had to drop the seats down, I had to tie it down and stuff. But I came home with a studio <laughs> and uh, I never looked back. Next special. I heard that song had he had he had a heart. He had a, how we say in English, in music business we say he had a balls. Excuse me, he's had the record had, and I, I found Dulette McDonald. She was doing my back. She was a studio singer, and she, was, after I took it to recording, Sting took it to work with him and the police. And she had it. Unfortunately for me, when I took the record, I didn't put too much time in the artist like spend money to promote it. Dulette McDonald had, her, her, her vocals. That she had is remarkable. Okay, she had it. And the song should have been here. I'm so lost in your love. Why can't I let you know? David Byrne, he was doing a song, okay? With August Dernell. But they heard the lead doing, we were using the same studio, blank tape recording studio in West 20th Street in Manhattan. They heard her singing the background vocals, and he took it with her talking hands. Yo, I don't even know how to explain it, B. A lot of this shit comes from rock too, not just punk. That's what people do. They want to keep a racist thing, but come on, B. To me, they were the ones that pushed for punk. Who didn't love fucking Led Zeppelin, Black Sabbath? Come on, you know, the who, you know, ACDC, there's people that just don't get it. Even like Earth, Wind, and Fire, they had smooth shit, but some of them shits, they had, they had some hard shit, you know? Just like they had the T-Connection group, you know? B uh, BT Express, you know? They had a lot of, they had some, you know, war, come on. 
I mean, people talk shit about disco. I don't even understand. That's why half these people, like, I don't understand half these hip hoppers that talk about the old school hip hoppers. But my generation talking like, oh, but disco, eh? Come on, B. You know how many fucking disco names and disco words were in hip hop? The Disco 3. I was down with Zulu Nation, Soundmaster Disco Crew. Come on, you know? Disco Mario, you know? Disco Wiz, the first Latino DJ. Yeah, I think people just want to just have something to hate because I didn't hate disco. Disco brought the guys and girls together, brought some funky music and funky beats too, you know? Brought flavor dance where you could rock to, you could beat boy to, and you could hustle to. You could dance by yourself or you could dance with a girl. Disco was dope. You want to go in, cl in the clubs? You want to hear the big decibel hitting you? Boom, boom. You got to hear. Even on a bass line, on a snare drum, you're going to go in discotheque. This is the truth. However you want to look at it.